This is Window on the East, a podcast from BNE IntelliNews. Subscribe at bne.eu. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to a BNE webinar. Um, today, I'm joined by uh, two old friends who've actually been on these podcasts before. Um, the first is uh, Chris Weefer. He's the founder and CEO of Macro Advisories, uh, Macro Advisor, um, which is a consulting house um, talking about uh, business economics in the former Soviet Union space and, and uh, Russia in particular. Um, he's also former head of research at pretty much every investment bank, both Russian and international in Moscow, who's been doing it for many years. Um, also by Christoph Ruhl. Um, he is now... Um, Senior Research Scholar at the Center of Global Energy Policy with Columbia University and a former Chief Economist at BP. And I always forget which one it is. Is it the World Bank or the IMF? The it was, it was, it was the World Bank. The World Bank, yes. Uh, Chief Economist for Russia in uh, at the World Bank, um, where we first met many years ago. And we're going to do, today dive in and talk about the whole oil situation. So before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. For those who want, um, if you use the chat function, you can ask questions as we go. We'll try and answer them as they come up. Uh, I can ask both Chris and Christoph to keep an eye on the ch on the uh, the chats, the questions, and if you see anything relevant, please um, pick it up and throw it into the conversation. And also, um, you can find at the end of this, um, links to a recorded version on YouTube uh, via bne.eu slash welcome. There is also links um, to things like, uh, I recommend you sign up for our editor's picks. It's our daily digest of our best stories the last 24 hours, which is great to read. And if you're in the game and want more of this sort of information in more detail, then we report daily um, on our premium, premium pro service. And again, you can sign up for two week trial at bne.eu slash welcome. So, gentlemen, uh, let's dive in. Um, oil, oil is the the sanctions are probably the most serious sanctions that that Russia faces. In so much as um, the idea is to sanction them in such a way as to cut the Kremlin off from its cash, its cash cow, um, but at the same time not to disrupt the flow of oil into the market and cause a shortage and then spike the prices. Um, and the oil. Sanctions only came into effect um, the first round in December, the fifth, where there was an embargo and the introduction of the price cap, which capped prices at $60. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And of course, on February 5th, those sanctions were extended to include oil products, things like diesel fuel, uh, kerosene. And looking back over the last year, the sanctioning of oil, the self-sanctioning of oil started almost immediately in so much as traders, although oil was not sanctioned at the beginning of the war, um, traders then would not buy, would not touch Russian oil. And for the first two months, uh, the oil started piling up. But then as the year wore on, um, the market did its thing. And most of the oil, I think all of the oil that was going to the EU ended up going to India and China. And India in particular had never bought much Russian oil at all. And now it's one of the biggest buyers and the Chinese too were, were buying, I mean, they, they tried to cap the, the oil from individual suppliers to 15%, but they sort of abandoned that and opportunistically started buying this oil because it was deeply discounted. And as far as I understand, um, they absorbed all of the EU oil. And at the beginning of the year, I mean, I think even the Russian position was that uh, reduction was going to go down by some 15%. And as far as I know, by the end of the year, actually Russia produced more oil than it did in 2021. Is that fair? I mean, can we say that the the, the sanctions or the self-sanctioning that have not affected, that all this happened is there's been a rerouting of a, re, a remake of the market where Russia no longer sells oil to Europe, but instead now sells it in Asia, I'm talking about crude here. I don't know. Who wants to go first? Uh, well, let me jump in. <clears throat> First of all, I should say to anybody, you don't need to adjust your screen. I've been off for a few days and I stupidly went out in a boat. So I look like a beetroot. So it's sorry if, if, if it's blaring at you. Um, yeah, look, look, I think last year was a huge learning curve for everybody. Expectations, uh, which, uh, you know, traders, the oil market, but even Russia had at the start of sanctions, 
all had to change and were changed as we went through through the year. So as you say, quite rightly, there was initially a big slump in uh, trade with Russian prices, but pretty soon pick, picked up. So what we saw for most of last year on the one hand was uh, a kind of oil customers and traders in Europe uh, buying as much crude and particularly oil products as they could from, from Russia in anticipation of the, the sanctions, the bans that were coming, you say, December the 5th for crude, February the 5th for, for diesel. So we had a huge surge. And that, of course, led to a, almost a windfall in terms of oil export revenues for Russia last year. We, we saw that the, the uh, trade surplus was $280 billion up from 190 the year before. And because there was a huge scramble to buy uh, or crude and particularly products from Russia before the, the bans kicked in. Now, in terms of the uh, crude, uh, we, we, we have seen a, a lot of that crude uh, go to Asian markets. As you say, India in particular has been a big buyer. Um, and Russia has been able to do a lot of that. It's been able to get tankers. It's been able to increase uh, trade in some, some routes. But really, that's now changing. I think this, the, the, the kind of the, the, the summary picture here is that is that last year Russia was in a strong position and able to divert to, to divert almost all the crude it lost to Europe to the Asian markets, and the that there were strong kind of European buyers for products, etc., ahead of the bans. Now we have a different situation uh, where, where both those bans are in place. And there is an infrastructure problem. Um, the the, the 2.8 million barrels of product, 50% of which was diesel, uh, mm. which stopped Europe from the 5th of February. Uh, absolutely, but by no means all of that uh, can get to any other market because there isn't the means to deliver it in terms of tanker or rail cars or, or, or pipelines. Russia has been scrambling to buy tankers, as we know. There's been a lot in that in the media about the so called great tankers. But it physically will not be able to shift that that um, that product, and that's why we've heard from Deputy Prime Minister Mr. Novak saying that oil production will go down by a half million barrels a day on average in March. Mm. Uh, they're waiting to see exactly how much of of the oil they will be able to divert the product and what will be the impact. And we're not going to get a clearer picture of this for several more months. And what you can right. say is that there is going to be a drop. We calculate somewhere between a million barrels and a million and a half barrels Russia will lose from exports and therefore from production. And the reason is not a lack of customers. The, the reason is they will not be able to shift it or deliver it to other markets right. because of infrastructure. I, I want to drill into the ghost so, fleets uh, in a minute um, and also the the, the issue of, of the pipelines. Um, but, but first, I was looking specifically at production um, and if I remember correctly, when, you know, today, a year ago, just before the war started, uh, Russia was producing about 11 million barrels a day, which mm -hmm. was near its all time high. And I just the, the production at the moment, I mean, given the self sanctioning that's going on and the remake of the market, I mean, we're still at um, 11 million, or I think they just reported 10.25 um, for, for January. But is that right, Chris? I mean, the, the production so mm -hmm. far is, is held up. Uh, it has held up because uh, there was an enormous scramble for diesel ahead of the February the 5th. Russia was exporting record volumes of diesel to Europe and other products to Europe ahead of the ban. 2.8 million barrels on average a day uh, for almost six months up to January. Uh, and also, I'd say, the crude uh, successfully shifting a lot of that to Asia, to, to India, and to other, other markets. So mm -hmm. really, it is February. The February numbers, the March numbers, is where you're going to see the big drop. Or you're, we're going to see what is the impact of the accumulation of these two sanctions. It's only then, because up to right. this point, up to the end of January, I say, Everybody was scrambling for Russian oil, uh, and, and Russia was able to divert it. But that really has changed from the beginning of February, and we simply don't know to what extent yet until we see probably the March numbers rather than even the February numbers. Uh, so coming into April, we'll have a much clearer picture. We'll be able to assess what the impact in terms of the budget is, and then we'll have a better picture of what uh, Russia's kind of stability in terms of funding uh, and the economic outlook will be, and not before that. Christoph, what about, what's your take? Because, I mean, when we talked about this, I mean, it was on the, just after the war started, um, and we were talking about um, wartime economy mentality, and with the outlook for the, for the oil, particularly for the discounts, 
we were saying then that they're going to be heavily discounted. Um, and however, it seems that, you know, the discounts did appear immediately after the war started with the self-sanctioning, blew out something like 35 bucks from between euros and Brent from the traditional $2 discount that the euros used to have. Um, but then looking at the November numbers for, for India in particular, there was no discount at all. And I think it was either Novak or one of the other ministers came out and said that in, even now in January, there's no discount uh, for, for oil that's headed to Asia. Didn't it all go a lot better for Russia than we expected? I'm not so sure. I mean, it goes slower than we have expected. But I think when you have this kind of maze of detail, then I'm a great friend of trying to step back and just get some order mm. in it. And what you said initially that we faced on a huge learning curve is in this whole sanction business, no more, more true than in the oil market. And remember what happened when, when Russia actually started the military invasion, which surprised most people, there was an economic sanctions program prepared. So this terminus of economic warfare is completely justified here. And a key section of that were sanctions. And they were implemented immediately, mostly in the financial sector, but not in energy, not in oil, not in gas, not in coal initially. Mm -hmm. That was because nobody really had any experience. Here was like more than 50% of global GDP, which is the G7 plus European Union, plus uh, assorted allies like Australia or Japan, or you know, like Australia, more than 50% of global G GDP against about 12, 13% of commercially traded energy, completely unprecedented situation. Of course, the 50 plus percent GDP need the 12 plus percent energy to be produced. Right? And then we started learning the first effect was the discount. That was not something which was intended or many people had on the radar. It happened very quickly and uh, it was very clear why it happened. And this is a, this is a risk premium, this is like you said, traders uh, not wanting initially to touch Russian oil exports with a long pole because uh, you know, we don't know about the juridical, the financial and the, and the reputational impact that has. So the discount started to widen and you can track it over the year to your question. It narrows when the situation stabilizes and becomes more clear and it widens if another dose of uncertainty is introduced either in economic sanctions or even in the military situation. So that discovery of the discount was the second one. Then the third thing which we learned is initially when there was talk about oil sanctions, in particular in Europe, it was always part of the game to uh, cut Russian export volumes and not just prices. And the reason for that was the experience of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the different nature of, of ex-Soviet or Russian fields, which are very different from fields in the Middle East in the sense that you need a multitude of small wells to produce the oil, not one or two uh, big ones and that you cannot scale them so easily. So the experience from the Soviet Union was that once it collapsed, production collapsed, production capacity is damaged by higher water cut, by freezing over, by erosion, by all sorts of things. So that it took, in this case, more than 25 years and a huge amount of Western capital and technology to bring them back up to pre-Soviet production levels. And it is true at the other extreme in 2020, with COVID, we know Russian production declined by 2 million and came up in no time. So that was not a damage in production capacity, but somewhere between these two extremes lies a red line. When you cross it, Russian capacity is permanently damaged. And in, initially it was part of the sanctions concept to get to this point. That was quickly given up when prices sort of started, started initially to go up. And when the inside sort of got a foothold in particular in the US, that they didn't want to risk paying for the sanctions, so to speak, by higher oil prices. And that was when this idea started to be floated. Maybe we can just attack the prices the Russian get by widening or stabilizing the discount. And we don't have to bring down volumes to the same extent. And maybe this way we can have our lunch and eat it too by having lower revenues for Russia, but lower overall oil prices. And that was the marriage of the American idea of a price cap with the European sort of not thought through courage in, in, in cutting oil. The price cap itself is not a particular brilliant idea. I don't think you, you usually get punished for the law of unintended consequences if you introduce multiple prices for the same product. But here it was never tested. And instead, mm. the market, as you said, did its thing. This has very little to do with self sanctioning. It was just a redirecting of the trade flows, which happened more or less effectively. And I think when we now, this was in, in, in response to the crude oil. Uh, embargo, when we now look at products, I don't think that will cause a problem at all. 
because a little discussed provision in that embargo of the European Union says that when the crude is blended and contains Russian crude and crude from somewhere else in a third country, that the resulting products are not subject to an embargo. And it does not specify how large the Russian share might be. So in addition to the usual redirection, which we are seeing now, we will find a lot of these products continue to go to Europe, you know, first into the Middle East and then relabeled and back to Europe. Uh, and also it helps, it helps to last for in that game that you can chemically test a tanker full of crude oil and you can determine very closely where it comes from. Right. You can't do the same with products. It's basically anonymous. Can, can I ask maybe what's a stupid question? Because it seems to me, you know, going into the sanctions that yeah. the, you immediately think, you know, you stop Russia from selling oil, but actually that's not the goal here. And the way it's been structured um, means that you, you have in effect changed the makeup of the market of where the oil goes. Because if you take, for example, the oil that's been sent to India and the Americans have banned the import of, of Russian oil products, um, but the Indians are just refining it, and then their exports to America mm. have soared. And all you've done is introduce this dog leg in the process whereby you could have sent the crude straight to the States and they would have refined it. Now you have to send it to India and then it goes to the States. And then they're buying, in effect, Russian oil, but then they're not because they've sanctioned it, so you can't do it directly. And all in this is, is it's just a it's just a it's a massive distortion. But at the end of the day, um, you're still buying Russian oil, aren't you? Go ahead. Yes, and then and then what, what it does, it increases transaction costs for everyone. And uh, and at the end of the day, as you said, you're still buying Russian oil. Now, there are two very 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 big questions at the moment still open. If we accept the story that the market has done its thing and successfully redirected this and just increased the transactions for all of us. Otherwise, not much has changed. Still, to So it becomes so, a tax, doesn't it? I mean, it's effectively yeah, the sanctions it becomes, are a tax. It becomes a tax on consumers. It also becomes a source of comparative advantage for those countries who get the cheaper oil, India and China, compared to those countries who pay the world market price, the brand price uh, equivalent, like Europe and the US. But here are two questions which are I think of, of great uh, importance if we accept this kind of general storyline. Number one, China consumes about 15 million barrels per day, India maybe five, India exports everything, China has some almost four domestic production, but emerging markets just in Asia account for about 30 million barrels. So, so there's enough poor countries, there's Pakistan, there's Bangladesh, there's Thailand, there's Indonesia, there's Vietnam, uh, and enough markets, which could have been used and could still be used by Russia to bring down the discount, to start a bit of a bidding war. Why did that never happen? That's one big and very good question. So people would say uh, infrastructure bottlenecks, not sure. They do the numbers, they are landing points, they are loading points, they are pipelines. People would say they can't take the crude, they don't have refining capacity, not true. Many of these countries have a good mix between uh, refining capacity and crude import capacity. They can deal with both products. It hasn't happened. People say maybe not enough connections, no trading system in Russia. Or that is true, but over time it would adjust. And the other big explanation is that Russia actually didn't want to completely eliminate the discount to China and India for political reasons. Mm -hmm. So they are, are sort of willing to some extent uh, keep the cooperation with these two countries alive by foregoing some of the revenues. That's a Conspiracy, I have no evidence of that, but you know, this one. And the second big question is the $500,000 uh, barrel cut, which Chris has mentioned. Mm. Is that really because the oil comes out of their ears and the redirection takes time and there's too much and so they have to scale down production a little bit? Or is that a prelude to something which I could see if Russia stands with the back to the wall and gets into military trouble, which is to use the oil price as a weapon to divide the coalition and to bring, bring about an economic crisis in the West. I make it a bit provocative. These are the two main, main questions to, no one at the man, to which no one at the moment seems to have an answer. So just before we get onto the production cut and that question, uh, which is being debated a lot at the moment, um, to, hasn't this sanctions failed in so much as Russia still can sell its oil? The market is just adjusted and you've introduced these dog legs 
um, which is a tax, but at the end of the day, it's us who are paying the costs, because as you say, the, the, the cost of shipping, you used to be able to send from Primorsk to, to Rotterdam, it takes a few days, and now you've got to send a tanker for two months all the way to Asia and back in order to carry the same oil, which ends up on the same market to the same consumers. And we, the consumers here in Europe, are paying the extra uh, of those those transport costs. And so, me, um, it, go ahead. To me, they have not failed. To me, the sanctions, uh, the relevant comparator is not to say that Russia made more money in 22 than in 21. The relevant comparator is to say after the war, the print price jumped and Russia would have made a huge amount of money without the discount. And because of the discount, they increased from the situation which in revenues was actually quite minor. And so to that extent, the sanctions have worked and continue to work because there's still enough oil on the world bringing down the price. But it's true that the sanctions have not worked as well as they could have if the West would have been prepared to also address volume cuts. And they haven't. And the reason they haven't is that they were afraid of high oil prices. And so we are sort of right in the middle now energy sanctions kicking in very late, oil sanctions kicking in the latest. And uh, without the courage, which you need, you cannot have war, not even economic war, without expenses on ammunition and other things. So as you continue to have these half-baked sanctions, you will have only very marginal abstract uh, losses for Russia. In order to really have sufficient sanctions, you need to get to the volume question. And that means you need to be prepared to buy higher prices. Well, what do you think, Chris? I mean, another point you could say the sanctions have failed, that actually Russia had a current account surplus last year, of, I think it was $227 billion, which was more than twice the previous year of 120. And that was already an all time high. So Russia's actually almost sure. replaced the whole of the 300 billion that was frozen CBR money. Um, and is had, was it washed with all this cash coming in. And from that perspective, if, if the yeah. idea was to cut it off from the funding, then that failed. What do you think? Uh, look, it, it depends on what your yeah, it depends on what your expectation is, uh, what the your your objective was. So, for those who thought that sanctions would quickly bring Russia to its economic knees, cause financial crisis, starve the cash flow, and therefore force it to pull back from uh, East Ukraine, that clearly that hasn't happened, uh, and and that has failed, if you like, if that was the expectation, but. On the other hand, if the now sanctions are aimed at sort of long term damage against Russia, um, uh, you know, in terms of, of containing the uh, or degrading the economy so that Russia won't be, have the same sort of economic progress uh, as it was looked forward to uh, previously, and therefore you have a slow uh, degrading of the impact. Uh, then it's likely that that will work. So, in other words, it's, uh, it's, that's it's a new it's, goal. It's not I mean, going to have a quick. Yeah, I know it wasn't, but but that's now what you're having to look at because there there is now we we know that that uh, that, that possibility or, or or that's not going to happen because Russia is we're only talking about how much oil Russia will be able to shift to other markets and what will be the price of that oil, but we're not talking about Russia being cut off from cash flow or not having enough money. It will have enough money under any kind of a reasonable scenario. It will have cash flow. What you are looking at, though, is what is the kind of long term economic damage in terms of, you know, the economic progress and how that will affect people. But that's years. There, mm. there is no pressure today on the Kremlin to end this conflict because of economic pressures or social political pressures at home that's that's gone it's it's not going to have enough money to build massive bridges and to develop a technology sector or anything like that the national projects clearly not but it is going to have enough money uh to sustain the economy to to continue a stability so yeah absolutely therefore unfortunately uh, i think if, if you if, if anybody's looking at this next round of sanctions later on the sanctions saying okay this is going to change the picture and by the summer russia is going to have economic pressures and it'll change that's not going to happen uh, it doesn't, maybe, it doesn't seem to time. be coming in it doesn't seem to be coming into the debate because it seems to me that there's a real mismatch in so much as the sanctions yes. are effective that you've hobbled the long term the economic growth potential of russia is down to whatever it is one percent now long term and it should be it's still the emerging market it should be yes. six seven eight 
But the trouble is, is the damage that does will take, as you say, years to have an effect. Whereas Ukraine, 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 Ukraine desperately, desperately needs, needs help, help right yeah. now. It needs pressure on you, Russia now, you know, because Chris, I think your note was saying that you think the, the big offensive could start tomorrow on the anniversary. And there's no sure. sanctions that we can put on. Or maybe there are some with the oil, I mean, cutting oil completely that um, we could put on no. that would actually crash the Russian economy. I think it's no, it's, it's really it's really also functions of the guts the, of the cost the sanctioneer is prepared to bear, to carry. If if you cut if you address prices and volumes, you have more success. If you address only one, you have less success. But I think it makes probably sense to look at it from the other way and start at the military situation and understand the energy sanctions as a as a supporting tool. And then you can you know, go with military analysts and you have these two scenarios. One is Russia starts an offensive, gets at least the Donetsk, digs in and goes for a long entrenched you know, phase, which may entail negotiations. And the other extreme, Ukraine has it his way and cuts off uh, the, the, the Eastern Front from the Southern Front and puts pressure on Crimea and Russia panics. And then you will see very, very different oil market outcomes, which you can discuss under these military scenarios. So, that might be a more sensible way to go about it. Mm -hmm. Actually, can I wheel back to see, uh, Christopher, you, you, uh, one of the questions you asked. Uh, I did ask that several times uh, over the last year in, in Moscow about the discount and, and it seemed, as you say, that Russia was emphasizing India and, and China and Turkey in particular as alternative markets. And what about the other markets, as you say, maybe you get a better price. Uh, and every time the answer was that that was not under a consideration that the priority, as, as you alluded to, was to create this kind of strong relationships. Uh, you can buy them, I guess, is maybe a better way to do these relationships with countries like India and, and Turkey, uh, in, in particular, in addition to China. That was the priority, and therefore it was, it was not about cash flow. I mean, the, the Russian oil sector is now effectively nationalized. It is not working on a commercial basis. It's working on a, a cash flow basis. Uh, and is selling oil to where areas that suit the Kremlin. And the Kremlin's objective is to build these relationships with the new countries or with friendly countries, and therefore giving cheap energy in order to incentivize that and to therefore to broaden it is very much kind of their, their, their strategy. It's not about maximizing uh, the dollars for, for exports. It's about strengthening relationships with new countries that Isn't can that be... That is a very important piece of information. And that was my yeah. suspicion because the implication is that it becomes much less likely pending a military catastrophe for Russia to use oil as a weapon to bring, bring about a recession in the, in the, in the collective West. Correct? Surely um, the, the attitude to, to the oil sector now, I mean, when it was run pre-war, that it was about maximizing profits, it was a capitalist system. However, post-war, it's surely for the Kremlin, it's just a question about revenues. They don't care about profitability anymore. They just need to produce enough revenues in order to have cash to pay for all of the things that they need to that would support the social to stop a uh, public well, it's, uh, it's, unrest. It's, yeah, it's, it's not only that. Yeah, it's not as simple as that, as uh, Christopher was saying. It, it's it's partly about having enough money to do what you need, and uh, say funding the military campaign is a big chunk of it, but also providing enough money to ensure the domestic economy is ticking over. That means subsidies to state companies, ensuring employment uh, mm -hmm. and revenue, even though we're now hearing about more part-time working and some salary cuts, but ensuring that there's enough and critically supporting key uh, social programs like healthcare or education, et cetera. That's it. I mean, that, that, that those are the objectives in, 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 in the package. And as long as there's enough money for that, then really there isn't any pressure uh, okay. on, on, on the Kremlin. To, I, to I want to go on to else. the... But the other, priority, though, the, the other priority, though, is absolutely, it's about spending those relationships with, with countries in, 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 in Asia and, and in Central Asia and in the Gulf and using cheap energy to do it is a key part of the Kremlin strategy. And we will see a lot more of that this year. Already we're seeing it in Central Asia where, uh, as Russia's moving into Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, et cetera, with cheap gas, et cetera. We will see more of that using energy to cement those relationships and expand trade. There, there's a, a very oh, long can... tradition of that though. I mean, Gazprom was always a state tool of uh, foreign policy and Rosatom is playing that role now as well with the sale of uh, nuclear power stations to Africa. Sorry, Chris, I jumped in on you. Uh, what were you going to say? 
Now I wanted yeah, to Christoph. ask Chris. I wanted to ask uh, Chris. No, I'm sure you know that there's this discussion now on based on the January data, uh, whether the discount has come, considerably come down. Uh, some people, like the IIF, say that this they make this argument based on comparing customs data from Russia with the published euro price, and they say it doesn't add up. So when you take uh, actually the customs, the, the Russian revenues announced by customs, the euro's price must have been higher or the volumes must have been larger. Uh, some people make the argument that the discount has narrowed because the competition with other countries has uh, led to an increase in the euro's price, which is not in the Platz data. Where do you stand on that debate? And some people, including myself, would say, looking at all of this, uh, it's only a one data point in January where there were all sorts of changes, including in the tax base. It's probably meaningless and probably not a correct statement to say that the discount has meaningfully shrunk. What do you hear yeah. from that, from where you're standing? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think your last point is exactly what I've been hearing and I've been checking a lot. And we do, a macro advisory, we, we do double check data where we can, looking at trade data, for example, China and Turkey, cross-reference, et cetera. And you have to do that to try and validate uh, data rather than just accepting data points. But absolutely, I would say it, it's a data point. It's not a trend because first of all, remember there was a huge surge in buying Russian oil up to December the 5th. Uh, and literally the tanks in Europe are full uh, and in Rotterdam and everywhere else. They're just literally full. They bought as much as they could because nobody was gonna know what was gonna happen you know, coming into 2023. So building up and that helped this windfall revenue that Russia earned. But the fact then that there was a big drop in oil demand, oil exports, and Russia had to cut prices to sell it to get rid of it is not a surprise. Uh, also even maintenance, Primorsk and in the, the port out near Khadna, they delayed their autumn maintenance until December because they were so busy. So you had a 10, 15 day shutdown in Primorsk, you had a 10 day shutdown over in Khadna uh, for, for maintenance. So all of these things, in other words, the, the December and January data uh, was always going to show a big drop because of this transition. And I think the same in February with, with products. As I mentioned, product exports to Europe are running at a record 2.8 million barrels a day, as basically all traders and all the buyers were filling up as much as they could ahead of the cutoff and then wait to see what happens. So frankly, I think that it's a data point that may straddle the whole first quarter. We may not get a clearer picture hmm. of pricing and volumes until we get into, you know, in, well into, oh, into this, March. That's what everybody keeps telling me. But, but this running ahead of, and stocking up before the cutoff point, that would indicate a widening of the discount after the cutoff point. Whereas in it fact, would, what Goldman so Sachs and I think claim is a narrowing of the discount. Yeah, no, it's again, it's a data point, but also remember it was all distorted because Russia did another stage of the so-called tax maneuver. Essentially, this is moving so. the tax on oil to production rather than export. So you had a complete distortion in a lot of the, the, the trade and customs data because of that as well. So, so frankly, it's just uh, uh, very difficult to, to, to use can any I, of that extraction. Can I ask we, both we, of you, to what extent is the euro's price relevant at all? Um, I was talking to Elena Rybakova uh, to IIF, and she was saying the market's gone dark. Um, people are not reporting anymore. The, a lot of the oil trade used to go through the European Primos to Rotterdam, and then that went through mm -hmm. the, uh, the Baltic Exchange, and the people were very good about reporting the volumes and the prices. But now they don't want to. Uh, people are being, because there's all these games, ghost ships, oh, yeah. uh, scams, and so they're not reporting. And that the discounts being reported, um, they're anecdotal now that those agencies or the exchange is, is relying on ringing up tra traders and, and asking them for individual deals or, you know, selective deals. And that the euro's price is not relevant anymore. It's not actually the price on the market. Her, her paper yeah. and a note from Goldman are the reason why I was asking Chris that question. And she makes this argument that when you track revenue data as reported by Russell Customs, it doesn't square with the euro's price. And so therefore the euro's price must actually be higher than what has well, been in the past data. I think I agree with uh, Chris, maybe for different reasons. I think it's not serious, this argument, because it's really just based on one month's data point. This is not to, at least we cannot state that this is the beginning of some trend. Independently of that, euro's price, of course, is of limited relevance because all the ESPO uh, 
exports to China. That's not part of the euro's price, not part of the of the discount, but it is of relevance for India and for Turkey. Isn't there another aspect here, in so much as that the um, the sanctions uh, with the cap sixty dollars apply to the FOB, the free on board price? And uh, there's been reports that what's happening is that Russia's now set up all these services and so that if the Indians buy Russian oil, they don't get involved with anything. They don't get involved with the shipping. They don't get involved with the, with, with the insurance. And they have a uh, an FOB price of whatever it is, $46. But then by the time the ship unloads and the price that the Indians pay at the end of the day, you add another 25 bucks so that you went from $50 to $75, which was just a $5 uh, discount. And, and that's all perfectly legal under the sanctions because the sanctions specifically right. target the FOB price. Is, uh, is that true? Is that, is that another distortion? Yeah, we, we are certainly hearing uh, exactly that. Uh, there are so many different variants being talked about. Um, and, and that's certainly uh, one. And then now, of course, we know we're hearing more and more information about all these kind of new tanker uh, registrations, which have been opening in Dubai. Uh, which on a certain year carrying Russian oil and plying that trade. Uh, and again, the pricing has just become completely vague. Uh, actually, what, one, what, not to digress, but just in case of Urals, we, we, we certainly could be coming to the end of Urals because the Russian finance ministry, of course, is now wants to use uh, Dubai price. Uh, there was a debate whether to use Brent or Dubai, but Dubai price is seen as much more relevant because, of course, the customers, the new customers, India, Turkey, elsewhere, maybe East Africa, of course, it, it's com competition with the Dubai price. And so they're going to shift the tax formula to uh, using Dubai uh, crude as the reference point rather than euros or, or, or Brent. So there's a lot of... You can, is that because you can pay in dinar as well? Because there's already Indian deals uh, that are being settled in dinar, which means you get away from the dollar. The dinar is... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 I, I was going to say, yes, we we're hearing a lot of, uh, but the UA Durham, of course, it is the, uh, and we're hearing a lot of the uh, trades coming, coming that way. Remember, of course, the UAE and Russia are old hands at this because they, they both collaborated uh, in, in, in the 90s, the Iraqi oil embargo, whatever, they perfected that scheme <laughs> as to how to this. shift oil along the Gulf and out and get paid for it and move money around. So they, they, they are all, they're well practiced at this, although sometimes there are, nevertheless. There are sort of two and a half observations which, which matter in that context. One is that if it's true that they switched from Brent minus 20, as they had announced to Mervan, then I guess it is the, 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 the UAE crude benchmark. Uh, then this is certainly uh, just like the discount to India and China, an attempt to keep the alliance alive because the UAE was always very much interested, of course, in establishing a benchmark route themselves. Secondly, the dirham is tied to the dollar, of course. So it's very easy to switch away from the dollar into the dirham because de facto it doesn't change anything, but it diminishes as one step, you know, in this long journey of getting things out of the control of the dollar as a reserve currency. And then the half point, uh, the half observation is, there's of course a very long effort also on the other side of China to pay for its for its oil in, for, in from the Middle East in Remimbi uh, for the same purpose to get it out of the dollar orbit and to strengthen the Remimbi sort as a reserve currency. And when you now see that Russia's liquid reserves are usually uh, a bit pretty much reduced to Remimbi holdings, and that on the other hand, using a Dubai benchmark makes it possible to have Durham payments, then you can just see how that circle may close at some point. And the Remimbi gets involved into the oil trade between in this triangle between Russia, the UAE, and China, and uh, and all of that has to be understood, I think, as small steps towards uh, an attempt to get an increasing amount of international relevant transactions. And oil is definitely in this category, away from the orbit of dollar denomination, and therefore from direct U.S. control. Can, can we um, switch topics and, and look um, again at the, the products, um, the February 5th ban on products? Um, because it seems that the crude market has more or less remade itself and uh, India and China have taken up the slack. Yeah. But with the, with the products, um, my main question here is that you're sending crude to India and China who are refining it. 
But with the products, then Russia has a lot of products, and that was much more widely distributed in okay. Europe. And they, and the, the and the thing is, they can't send those to India and China. And the Russian products now are in direct competition with the products that India and China are producing. And can the market actually absorb it? And this is all highlighted by this debate about the 500,000 barrel cut that Novak announced. Although I, I just read that he's only going to do it for one month. And the debate yes. is that they had to do that because they can't sell the product. Or it could be that they can sell the product because they've already found new customers and they want to manipulate the price instead as a sort of a shock uh, to, to to warn everybody where it's going to go if things carry on. Chris, you... Chris, Look, to, to, say, um, to some extent, crude was easy because it's a very, you know, kind of, uh, what's the word? Uh, fluid, if <laughs> not the right word. Uh, it, it, it's movable. But, but product is, is obviously very different. Uh, and for, first of all, the volumes are much bigger. As I mentioned, Russia was exporting 2.8 million barrels of product to Europe, which is now banned. Uh, and it won't be, therefore, easy to, uh, we reckon that Russia might be able to, uh, to, to send about 50% of that to other markets. And that's where this kind of drop of at least a million barrels of production uh, under our scenario uh, kicks in, because where are you going to sell that product? Um, now, we, we, we can see that there are some ways, again, we we'll go back to, to the Emirates, uh, because there is a get out of jail clause, of course, in the, uh, in, in the sanction, which says that there is um, that, that Russian oil can be blended with mm. other product and that's what Christoph was saying you you can you chemically you can you can discover where where, where forensically you can see where oil crude oil comes from but not products. so, we, so we've, we've already you seen that, that so turkey turkey did massive uh, spike in import in diesel morocco as well and, and, uh, so uh, is. senegal we seeing, you know suddenly yeah. all these new players are coming in yeah absolutely uh, there, there's a couple of ports off malaysia of turkey and Fujera, uh, I mean, literally, uh, you know, you could, uh, okay, this is going to sound stupid, but you could literally go out to a tanker with a barrel full of, of crude, or sorry, barrel full of, of, of product from your refinery and throw it into a Russian tanker, and, and it technically qualifies, because there's nothing in the sanction that says X percent has to be from somewhere else. It just says it has to be yeah. a mixture. And, and so it just uh, makes the whole mixture. Point. You're seeing an enormous volume going through. Food. So yeah, I did, again, this is part of what I'm saying. We have to see how this uh, blends, because some of those tankers that Russia has been using on the Baltic Sea and sending into Europe uh, will, will not be able to go anywhere else. They're, they're, you know, they're local tankers. So we, we, we don't as yet know how much volume Russia will be able to ship on other tankers to other markets. Even if they how do you look, 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 look. I mean, last year was a year with record refining margins, refining capacity stretched. Russia, as you said, is a big exporter of products. As Ben indicated, we're already seeing a huge amount of Russian imports going, for example, to the Middle East and then coming out. Suddenly, the refineries of the Middle East produce a lot more products, which goes into Europe. And the, mm -hmm. the, the icing of, that, of the cake is that it's not even illegal because of this provision that you can blend it. So I really don't see a problem in the medium term of adjusting the product flows. I think, if anything, this will be more straightforward and easier and more profitable than uh, it was the case for crude oil. So the 500,000 barrel cut is uh, a price thing. It's um, it's not because they, have, they oh, can't find customers. I don't know. This is, a, this is a very important question. For a price thing, it's not large enough. It's not threatening enough. I think this is both. This is a bit of testing flexibility and an attempt to smooth the transition. You know, it's, it's, uh, we, we know how it will play out, but markets take a few months probably to do this new tradeways and all that that has to be new blending facilities has to be established oil refining is, is, is much more of a process than just storing crude oil so, so most likely this... i think at this stage it was just uh, a measure to buffer the prices where they are isn't this like uh, Chris was saying, I mean, uh, at the beginning of the conversation that, you know, it's like the beginning of the war and then the traders wouldn't touch euros and then it took a couple of months for the market to do its thing. And now we've introduced a new distortion, um, which is the, the ban on products. And so now everybody's scrambling to work out the new routes and the, um, the, yeah. the collapse in oil revenues as well, I think is related to that, that sort of disjoint uh, that just happened. Um, but it'll take several months and with these new players like Turkey, Morocco, Algeria, Senegal, who are taking the diesel, because mm. we've got the problem that it takes two months for the tankers to go there and come back. 
And so we actually haven't had enough time. It'll only be next month or the month after when this yes. new system is starting to operate smoothly. Yeah. With the yeah it will take time, but it will not be a fundamental problem. That's my point. Mm -hmm. And they and they they bridge the time by having this temporary cut, which also you know they are in a strong position because they know better than anybody else at the end of the day how the new flows look like, and this will likely make it much easier if the point comes where you want to cut to influence prices to be able to fine tune these cuts much better than before the war when all, everything was exported everywhere with a big shotgun approach. Mm -hmm. Now you can target it much more precisely, should this come. But the signal for this kind of interference in the markets, if Chris and I are right and they're trying to carry political favors by their oil policy, the signal for that would have to come from a pretty drastic defeat or, or problem on the military or political front, not from energy markets themselves. Mm -hmm. That's important. Yeah. And actually, there's, there's one other point as well I'm going to introduce here, which is that, as you say, all these suddenly we have all these kind of countries with, with major refineries that we never knew about before, Senegal and the likes. And the question now, of course, is uh, back to what you were saying, uh, Ben, earlier about how much pain uh, Western economies are willing to take. Because, uh, for example, uh, we, we know that the US Treasury has become very active in in traveling around as India and the Gulf and Turkey and elsewhere in Central Asia, kind of essentially warning countries uh, not to help Russia uh, avoid or evade sanctions. So I don't mean sanctions bust, busting, but helping Russia to kind of uh, evade the sanctions and keep the, so the, you know, the, the and US Treasury, of course, does have the mechanism, it has the muscle. Um, and to in, you know to to come down quite heavy and and to to put pressure on countries to stop cooperating with with Russia, but if that were to happen, then you would have an enormous spike in the price of diesel and petrol and other you know kind of uh, gas station prices uh, across Europe and probably in some parts of the the U.S. as well. So you know if does it if, does it really have the muscle though? So look, let's talk about the the budget, the revenues. Well, because, we have uh, seen. The, well, there was a collapse. Well, we've in the seen revenues. the U.S. I mean, look. look, my point was uh, with the budget. The the you know the eleven months of surplus last year with a bit of jiggery pokery in November and Gazprom. However, the revenues right. collapsed by almost four trillion in just December, and we started January with a deficit of whatever it was, one point eight trillion rubles, um, about forty million bucks. No, less than that, twenty million bucks. Um, mm. But then. If this market, if it, that would imply that the deficit for this year, at the moment, the official um, position is like two trillion rubles deficit this year, but we had almost two trillion just in January. Yeah, no, and then I don't make this mistake. Then, but this is uh, when you compare January twenty three with January twenty two. Right? What do you see is in twenty three after the December adjustment, oil prices coming down, exports stabilizing. What do you see in twenty two? everybody trying to get as much oil as possible, prices being sky. Uh, no, when you compare that, even not, not even looking at the revenue and the tax base discussion side, then what you see is this, you just have an exceptional bad month. And uh, one shouldn't extrapolate from that easily for the rest of the year. I really think because that would be- a, People are using that there, there are two other factors the sanctions well, though, are working. The, I mean, it's the pain you were talking no, about. The, people the, the, no, that is wrong. That that is absolutely wrong. It uh, drives me crazy when when people uh, indulge in what I I call political economics, where where you start off with what you'd like to achieve and then try be selective with the data to prove it. It is simply mm. not the case in January. In January, we ha had a, a couple of unusual factors which won't be repeated. First of all, there was the adjustment in the tax payment system. Yes. The, right, mm. the finance ministry went to a one date unified payment. And they said at the before January and repeatedly January that the revenues because of that may be delayed into February and that it could be a couple of months before it smooths out. And we did see a big drop in things like VAT and excise, which can be directly linked to that tax maneuver and they will reappear. There'll be a big surge in revenue in February or March. It'll just be the smoothing out the last January numbers. Also, there was a big allocation of spending in January that wasn't uh, that, that wasn't expected in January to come. What else could it be for? And again, that's not going to be repeated. And then in the backdrop we've been talking about is this distortion in exports and 
in reporting and kind of all of the games that everybody's been playing on. So uh, absolutely, 100% agree with Christoph. You cannot use a data point, one month's data. It will be February, March before it smooths out. And the finance ministry, a long chat with the deputy minister last week about that. And he was also throwing his hands up saying, people are not listening to us. They're still confident that their forecast for the budget deficit this year is on track and those distortions will be smoothed out by the end of Q1. That's what he told me. So we have to wait and see, but it makes sense. But he said, rather than assuming it was a disaster in January, that'll be repeated. So we're looking at something around 2% of GDP deficits. And yeah. given the money, the 85 billion that's or six, six, seven trillion that's in the National Wealth Fund, plus um, the three trillion of OFZ oh, they're planning to issue, there's plenty of money to, to finance that gap. I mean, Russia's probably got enough money for three years at sure. uh, that kind of yeah. deficit. That, that's exactly and, what we're saying. But there's no yeah. prospect of collapse or financial collapse or anything that puts so you, you know, you're, economic you're, or so. You start these sanctions with this big bang on the financial sector side. You sort of go by tightening up everything until, as the coalition I'm talking about, until you're really cornered and you need to address the energy question. You start doing that, but then you shy away from it a little bit. You don't want to go to be too drastic because you don't trust your own ability to withstand higher oil prices, despite the positive experience of Europe and, and, and the gas markets. And that's the, where your question comes in. If you're not willing to take more pain, then you should not expect the sanctions to do more on the, on the mm. energy front. Nevertheless, because the general, the global situation in energy is one, no matter what the Goldman Sachs of this world say, or a tendency towards success supply and not success demand. You see distortions and then it coming down and distortions are coming down always again and again. Nevertheless, Russia will at least not sort of implode its, or explode its revenues endlessly. Uh, and while, while it's still able to make these kind of political deals and to try to form an alliance with giving a carrot to the India's, China's, UAE's of this world, which is to get themselves a little bit more independent out of the mm. uh, US dollar orbit into this multipolar world that many people are talking about. But in order going forward, in order to expect something different from energy markets, you would have to either tighten the sanctions considerably, including Western pain in the form of higher oil prices, or the more likely scenario, you have to concentrate on the military situation. And yeah. if Russia is in dire straits there, because for example, if Crimea is threatened, then it will use oil as a weapon and in the course of that, destroy a lot of things. Because have you heard this expression, holy crisis? People talk about a crisis here and there rather than one crisis after another. So the common effect of these crises is worse than it's, it's one yeah. uh, story, in the story, story. But Russia's Tuz. time so it was Adam is still Tuz. much yeah. much more in a in a Wagnerian snarl at the end, you know, than they burn the bridges, all of them. <laughs> We're coming, into the home, we're coming into the home straight, and there's one important topic I want to briefly touch on, which is the, the ghost fleet. Um, my question is, like, how many tankers actually are there? Because I've seen anything between 100 and 600. And in theory, Russia can just dodge the sanctions completely. But is the capacity of those ships enough to carry, say, all the product with 2.8 million barrels? Chris, I mean, you mentioned like um, infrastructural bottlenecks because there's also the, the Greeks are playing a role here and Twitter's filling up with all these geolocated tankers that are just sort of hanging out off the coast of Greece and clearly doing ship to ship transfers. And with the blending, it means that you yes. could probably get most of that oil blended and it's in a ship to ship with the with EU company. Uh, and at the same time, take the rest on your own tankers. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, when I said about our scenario where we expect a million barrels drop uh, up to a million and a half, uh, yeah, the number of tankers that have suddenly appeared is an enormous surprise. I, I mean, who knew there were that many tankers around the world that you could get hold of? It's certainly in the hundreds as to whether it's closer to 200 or, or five or 600. I, I simply, we simply don't know yet. We will know in a few mm. months' time. We see the volumes, but right now we don't know. Um, but there's a heck of a lot. There's an enormous amount. And as you say, there's a lot of ship to ship transfers taking place. Um, and, and that's the way it, it will go. So, so yeah, I, look, I, I don't have an answer to that. You could certainly figure out the crude flows better because it, it, it is easier. Uh, the, the, the refined product. Uh, will be more, more, more complicated in some ways. Um, but it'll come down to as much pain 
say, Western economies uh, want to take. For example, if they were to block the sewers, for example, transit, uh, or cause that to be blocked, uh, unless ships had some, you know, paperwork, whatever, to prove it wasn't Russian, you know, that that would block the trade. But would have, you know, we would double the price of gasoline at least in in European prices immediately. So it really, you know, I think it's the same thing over and over. If, if Western economies want to limit the damage to their to their population and to their economies, then they cannot fully enforce. They can make life difficult for Russia uh, and and add transaction costs, uh, but the they they can't. The way you're talking, it, it sounds like the, the products. Sorry, the products. Uh, it sounds like a bit of Swiss cheese. I mean, don't you need to introduce something like blood diamond documentation on the origin of the oil? At the moment, there's not nothing like that, uh, and so you're free to have no, all these scams. Yeah, well, you know, you you can choose to buy a diamond ring if not but you pretty much have to pull in and fill your tank with gasoline and diesel very often so uh, I'm, I'm not going to say it's different this time but but yeah, yeah. It, comes to, it comes it comes down what we said earlier so it's difficult technically more difficult than dealing with crude therefore it will take longer but without further sharpening of the sanctions it will settle in and happen the other way around is an interesting question just as the west collective West could tighten sanctions specifically to make life difficult for product export. So in the future, Russia could use these new complicated ways of product exports, which will emerge to cut them in order to drive up prices at the pump and without even using the crude oil market uh, to, to that extent in a much more direct way. That's a bit the fear here when they decide to use oil as a weapon that this complicated trade uh, you know, network, which, which now is being established, could actually be abused more easily than what we had before. Because aren't we, at the end of the day, with all these distortions that, you know, or sanctions that have been introduced, I mean, we, we, we're now engaging, we, we've taken one of the biggest and most efficient markets in the world and introduced massive distortions. And then to enforce that, isn't this just going to turn into a huge global game of whack-a-mole? where the states are flying around already and having meetings in South America or, or Latin America, South Africa, uh, trying to get people on board. But in order to, every time they come and whack the mole with one of those meetings, then it's possible to make a, a new a new game. You know, you go to, to the Senegalese or you, you do a deal that's with it. That's the sign of an efficient market then. <laughs> what, what, what happens, what, what follows from there is something else, which is rarely discussed. At some point, the war will be over. Not mm -hmm. necessarily with a peace treaty, but in the sense of the shooting stops. People will no longer refer to it as yeah, a Yeah, I, I think that there the bottom line is that it could, it could be, you know, what we see. European bl bl blighted by weapons of mass. I don't know which scenario, but we know a few things which will happen next. And one of them is a big, uh, big downturn in commodity and energy prices as the cycle turns and as all these distortions get back to normal, as you assume that Russia remains on this planet and remains a big export. Another thing which we know is that uh, many governments in the Western world will be poorer and debt levels much higher, in particular in Europe. The third thing which we know is that because of rising CO2 emissions and all the other failures of the energy transition, uh, this transition will now have to be proceed faster with less financial means, so good days for carbon pricing. So that is a direction where we can make use of these developments to work out some trends that hasn't happened yet. Okay. Chris, last few minutes, go and you can sign off. What, what yeah. do you think? Okay. Let me see. Sorry, two, again. Two things. Uh, one is that uh, I think what we now know is that the sanctions in the oil market are not going to bring an end are not going to bring an end to the conflict. They're not going to put pressure on Russia. There's enough uh, ways around that for, for Russia to continue uh, with a different economy, but but to continue uh, and just adds costs. Uh, it, it adds costs to Russia. It adds costs to to Western uh, economies. But it's it, but the oil sanctions, which a lot of people thought would be the deciding sanction to bring Russia to its knees, clearly is not going to happen. And there was one question from John Schiffer, if you wouldn't mind. I just asked, but Paris Siberia 1 and 2 are only gas pipes. They're not oil. It'll get up to about 40 billion cubic meters. Oh. And Paris Siberia 2 hasn't even got to the drawing board yet. Uh, best case scenario is that Paris Siberia 2, if built, 
will probably be almost at the end of the decade, but about 50 BCM. But also that's gas from the Far East. It does not offer an alternative for the gas that has been going to Europe. It can't switch to power of Siberia or, or two when it, it's ready because they're different parts of, of, of the country. So yeah. they, 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 we could talk another hour about gas, but yes. yeah, clearly we gas have to is do not another... something that Russia is able to, 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 to shift to any of the markets for years and without billions of costs. It's, it's quite different to, to oil. We'll have to do another one of these sessions on, on gas, which is a whole different kettle of fish. So guys, look, we've run out of time. So I'd like to thank you both, uh, Chris Weaver and Christoph Rule, very much for joining me yet again. Uh, absolutely fascinating, big, complicated subject. And I think we need to reconvene in about two months' time um, when all the the, the 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 tankers have gone to Asia and come back again, and we actually have a sort of regular flow and see where we stand. To everyone out there listening, thank you very much for attending. Um, and uh, again, I point you to bne.eu slash welcome. Have a look there. You can find links to our YouTube channel, to our Editor's Picks Digest and various other goodies. Uh, try the pro service if you're interested in all of this. We write about it every day. So until we meet again and have our next webinar, thank you again for joining us. Thanks again to my guests. Goodbye from me. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.